Hi all, this is live video starting and we are good. Hi, AO, AO, AO. Good to be back. It's Greg Yamico here and got a lot of questions. So I'm going to normally I give a little history, but if you want more history, go back to a previous uh, one that I've done. I'm going to shorten that up a little bit today. In my early career, I had an investment firm. I grew that in the 90s and then early 2000s. Um, I ended up selling it around 2005. In 2004, though, I started a software company. I went to India and I set up a development team there. That's my team and grew that to where um, over time we evolved in different things, but we, we about around 2010, I saw the future being mobile apps and we started building mobile apps and e-commerce applications to help people you know, be more productive, sell online, get more exposure to their clients and so forth. We also do a lot of database integration to build dashboards and so on. So that's kind of my history, give you some perspective of where I'm coming from. I am a consummate learner in business, love business. I've been part of the entrepreneurs organization since 99. I've traveled around the world to 20 plus major conferences along with um, umpteen another 30 regional conferences in different parts of the world. So with that, I'm going to jump into the questions and let's see what we can do to provide some insight into your, your all's world. Okay, so Lena asks, how do I find money to pay for things as a new business owner when cash flow is super tight and we just don't have money for certain things like websites, marketing, etc.? Business description and background question. I've been trying to set up the website myself, but it's very difficult. I've checked YouTube, how to do videos, tutorials, but it's far too confusing for me. I have looked into uh, Fever, but as I'm hesitant, I know I need a better e-commerce website and some other things for the business in order to grow sales, but I feel s stuck knowing how to get it done and pay for it. What did you do to find money to pay for things in the beginning? Well, Lena, that's a, a very good question and that there's so many different ways to answer it, but typically it's the friends, family, and credit cards approach is usually what a lot of small business people do. And there's opportunities to maybe put take money out against a home equity loan. There's opportunities to go to a bank. But usually small businesses have a very tough time doing that. They don't have a lot of cash flow to show. They don't have a lot of revenue history to show. And banks will not give you money in that situation. So what, what most of us do is this: we just rough it and we grind until we get into a place where things get better. And that's just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Is that having that tenacious, tenacious type of approach to life and to business and following your passion. Hopefully you're in business now because you're passionate about something and passionate about this world that you're trying to, um, to grow out. So um, well, a couple of things I would suggest here is that uh, if you can get money from, if you really need cash flow uh, or money to support your, your, your cash operations, then I would, um, be looking at talking to some people, see if you can get a loan from a friend, family member, or, um, you know, that's, yeah, it's, those are tough conversations to have, but maybe you have some credit cards. Seems like credit card people throw, throw credit cards at you all over the place. So maybe that's a way to get, uh, get access to some money, but just, you got to be careful with that. You got to make sure you make those minimum payments and keep that credit line or keep the credit, um, uh, history excellent as far as, uh, the making your payments. Well, it's one thing you do not want because it'll hurt a business really bad is to get have bad credit. So, I mean, if you have to resort to eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or macaroni and cheese, so you have enough money to make your credit card payments, uh, your minimum credit card payments, I would suggest that. I've done that in the past, and uh, you do not want to mess up your credit history because of situations like this. Getting access to money. I'm in a situation where I don't need money. Um, I have access to money when I need it for some of the real estate things that I do, but I don't want to uh, be in that situation that I've been in the past. So I just got to push here. So a couple suggestions for you. The uh, the, the the Fiverr uh, site, and there's a few others out there, I would look at using that. You said you were hesitant. I would explore some different options to help you cost effectively get your website up so you can get it out there into the e-commerce space, okay? Um, and the e-commerce website. I would look at considering a Shopify option. 
okay Shopify is a great site I've put together a bunch for my clients I've customized it um, or I mean I've set them up and then I've customized it for them respective to their situation so it's great when you don't have to go build your own uh, e-commerce I've built clients e-commerce applications I've modified and set up Magento type of applications I've modified and set up um, Shopify type of applications and you can do that pretty simply and maybe there's there's people out there that can help you and once you shopify once you set up shopify you could you maybe use some of the customer support i don't know your business but you could potentially get that up and running very easily uh, doing some of yourself um what you were look, looking at trying to do on your own okay they have tutorials and things like that that can help you in a and a support system so i would i would explore that to get your to get your e-commerce application up and running, the um, and then just um, you know look at the reviews on the site. Find somebody that can help you with the specific needs that you have, and then I would set a list of requirements to make sure that they are uh, going to do, and then pay as you can to just get that respective area of work done. And maybe test them out with a small piece of work. Okay, can you do this? Get my site up and get it on, uh, get it hosted somewhere. Do the small things and pay per little task that you know that they're getting it done. They're not leaving you hanging. They're not non-responsive type people. So try little steps and help that to so you can move forward there. Okay, that's what I have for you right now, Lena. Hopefully that helps. Come back with uh, more as you experience. Blank paper. Okay, so next question. Carrington ask, how can how could I make a loyalty program effective for my business? Business description and background of question. I own a photography agency focused on creating unique and creative product imagery for clients to use digitally to increase online sales. I have been unsuccessful over the past year or so to figure out a subscription model that would bring that would help bring in more clients revenue on a retainer or additional monthly income basis. I was wondering if a loyalty program where people can earn points and get rewards to excite them and spark more reoccurring bookings. I would love to hear your ideas on whether a loyalty program like this would be good for my business or what other options you would look at in order for me to create retainer clients as opposed to one-off bookings. Thanks so much. Yes, yes, Carrington, that is the way to go, okay? That's the future of business. That is the ultimate model you want to have is to is to have people paying you on a regular reoccurring basis to provide some service. That's what I've been working on in different areas um, with my software, custom software work I do, and I've got some things in the makings right now that I look I excited to put out there in the world. So. Um, a subscription model is very appropriate and very uh, right on potentially for what you're doing. How and what, those details are hard to come by because I don't know enough about your business. But I would go into Google and type subscription model, something like that. Okay, there's some books out there. I've read a few different books. Um, there's one called uh, Subscribe. The, why the subscription model will be your company's future and what to do about it. Okay, there's another one, the Forever Transaction, which is about membership businesses and so forth. I would um, I would consider this and look at options. Okay, so what can you do here for uh, for a subscription model? You could be looking at putting out things that are training videos for your clients about how they. Are supposed to post and so forth okay you could sell a training package to them that could um, could be a part of an online reoccurring well you can continue to do those sales and you're gonna make more money but you, you could also turn it into something like a membership program where they become members and they're gonna get access to things that you're gonna provide them okay so maybe even take all your work that you do and turn it into a membership approach there could be, they, there's membership things for all kinds of stuff out there and it could be a way for you to go. I would look at um, looking up Stu McLaren, S-T-U-M-C-L-A-R-E-N, okay? Look him up online, Google his name and he is a membership guru. Read his material, he's got a lot of free material out there and then some paid material. 
look at his material to give you ideas about if the membership approach is right for you. I looked at this model for something I was going to do and almost implemented it, and then we changed the model with um, the brainstorming of where the business was going. So I would consider those ideas and definitely moving forward in this area is a very scalable and attractive way to go and I highly recommend that you do it. But finding the right one is going to be the challenge. So what you have to do is read these books to get ideas about how others do them and how you can envision you doing yours. Okay, there's, um, you know, there's, 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 I've seen where contractors um, have created subscription models. And you think, well, how does a contractor, business, a building contractor, can tra uh, create subscription models about, you know, like they usually get paid for doing a certain amount of work and building something for somebody and then being done and moving on, right? Well, I've seen where contractors have done this, other types of people that you wouldn't expect do this. So I, I would explore this route and dig into it and find something that's gonna work for you because I think you're offering something to the world that they're gonna want with uh, so much of online activity being putting stuff up, Im imagery, pictures, videos, and if you can teach people how to do these things, they're gonna to wanna to pay for it. Next question, Robin asks, from a timeline perspective, what time frame should I be looking at to hit six figures in my business? Business description and background. A question, I am up and coming artist painting. I am working on building my portfolio, learning to sell, as well as even my own personal development. I come from a very limited mindset and I'm growing every day thanks to AO. How do I know if I am on the right path? I'm happy and know it's, um, and I'm happy and I know it is going slow, but how do I know if things are on the right path? How do you determine that for you? How would you determine that for you? Elevator pitch. As an artist, I help people feel moments of calm through my oil paintings of sunsets. So, Robin, you've asked many questions in the past. I hope things are going well for you. So, thoughts on this is that key thing here is that you said you had a limited mindset. I grew up with a limited mindset. I know what you're talking about. And even though I've had some pretty nice successes in my life, I still feel held back at times in that I have to adjust my thinking, okay? Um, I was just reminded of that the other day. I was with a very successful friend of mine who was at the casino and I sat in while he played at the high limits table and played blackjack. And um, he, he even said, he was, I was sitting next to him and you know he's betting $5,000 hands. And uh, just something I couldn't comprehend. But this guy has sold the company for uh, like a billion dollars or something, and he's just living life big right now and, and enjoying the fruits of what he put together. And so point is, is that as he was dealing these hands and things weren't looking good, I was making comments like, oh, that's, oh, that's not good. Oh, this and that. He, and he's like, why are you so negative? And he looks over at me and says, why are you so negative? And I'm like, well, it's like I, so I realized that I was putting out a negative vibe about the cards. I said, I, he's like, he's joking and laughing about it. But there was some reality there and some sense of truth that I was putting out negative energy relative to what he was doing. And so we don't want to do that. One way we can get around it is gratitude, okay? Thankful for what you have. Thankful for all the things that are in your life that are positive. Okay, so it could be as simple as the air you breathe. It could be as simple as the beautiful sunsets that you talk about and seeing those in reality. So whatever it is we can be grateful for, grateful for our health, grateful for the friends around us, grateful for um, the places we've seen, grateful for the chance to uh, live life in, in, in a free world, okay? You know, to live life without worry that somebody's gonna come take us out of our bed at night. Um, so it's just doing a lot of that and opening up yourself will, will could just change the way your mindset is putting out into that vibe it's putting out in the world into a more limited mindset instead of a more of abundant mindset. Okay, so I've talked about that before and hopefully that some of that resonates with you and you can do some things about it. So as far as your business, um, you know that 43% of all businesses are under $50,000 a year of revenue, okay? 
So think about where you are, knowing that it's tough, you're not alone. And as you may see successes out there in the world, getting to six figures is something that is um, that you may want to accomplish here uh, and, and moving on. I've gotten another question around that too. So, um, uh, so I would say that what you want to do here is approach with abundant mindset and just keep pushing forward with um, with your situation. Are you on the right path? Yes, you're following your passion, okay? It's what it feels like to me anyway and what the previous questions you've asked and so forth. You love what you do. You are putting out something of beauty in the world and making it happen. And with that, I would um, I would uh, keep doing it and, and keep move, pushing forward. You know, like I said previously, it's all about tenacity in business and it's pre perseverance, keep pushing when things don't seem like they're that good and it will change. I've been in some bad spots and it changed. So just keep going, okay? Next question. Robin asks, um, how would you respond to a prospect who says they do not have wall space for more art? Business description, background question. As artists working on location, this is often a response when a client sees and loves my art. With that, I started creating tiny drawings for tiny spaces. Thoughts? How would you overcome this objection? Well, that's a hard one because, it, well, it's hard from how do you overcome it because I've thought about that myself a little bit because I use that all the time. I was fortunate enough, my, those investment days went very well for a while, and I built a nice big house, and I was able to pay a high-end decorator to come in and just fancy it up. I was able, I had some of my personal things I bought over time and, and wanted that up on the walls, but she filled the house up with every area. And so as life went on, I would run into places and I would see beautiful pieces and a uh, beautiful piece of art. And actually one of the walls in my lower level were, um, was a painting I bought Aspen, an expensive painting um, or piece of art. It was kind of a, a design uh, aspect and really big. And they, she actually changed the whole wall um, to reflect the color because this thing was big. It was like, I don't know, uh, maybe five feet by four feet or something, a big piece. And uh, and so I, when I have time, I've walked into places and I have talked to people and I've looked at great things that really just resonated with me. And I'm like, where do I put that? You know, like they would try to, you know, put do the sale thing on me and I'm like, yeah, I get it and so forth, but I just don't know where to put it. Um, a few years ago, I had a good friend that I you know, was starting to do some business with. Um, he was in the entrepreneurial organization out of New York City, and he did art too. And I just um, I, I felt because of the relationship that I should get a piece of art from him, and I did. And I ended up taking something down and putting it up on the wall. So, how do you do that? When I've seen little pieces or things that like, hey, that's really cool and it's small, I could find a place for that. So the idea of doing the smaller drawings is really neat. And maybe even um, having suggestions for people where they can put them, like in bathrooms or you know, placing them beside, um, above a toilet or next to a sink or in different places that are in a house that maybe a lot of people are not thinking to have something up that they could find a place to put it or stack it on a stack some art in a statue type thing or a holder like where you have a smaller you have a, a larger piece a little bit smaller of a piece and maybe even a tiny piece that kind of flows together in some type of setting that they set on something that they normally don't hang on the wall okay um, and that way they could buy it and sit it and it's like I've got a table sitting over here that has a bowl thing on it but could use something on each side I don't have a lot of room on the on the walls in my this is my place down in Fort Lauderdale not my home in Knoxville and so I could put something up like that in one of these places that may resonate or somebody could sit on the back of their toilet a pretty piece of art to add some color or some life to that area or next to their bed 
So, or in the guest room or something like that. So just uh, continue to explore ideas and rack your brain around it. And as you see and search in the world, I'm sure you'll get some really good ideas. Hope that helped, Robin. Okay, next question. Carrington asks, how would you try and sell multiple services to one client? Business description and background question. I own a photography agency focused on creating unique and, cr and creative product imagery for clients to use digitally to increase online sales. Even though product photography is my core service, I see clients that also need and want content strategy help as well. This could be good for my business to add this fee. Yeah, this fee to my services and deepen the relationship with them. How would you approach selling them strategy sessions as well as other product photography without losing out on the photography revenue? I don't want to lose out on that revenue, but I see the need for for strategy. Uh, okay, so. Carrington, I do not think you're going to lose out by offering one or the other, okay? Looking at business, um, the general models of business is that there's usually what's called a revenue ladder, okay, where you offer a service at some level and then it steps up to another level of service and then it steps up to another level of service. And that is providing me probably more value. You can price it higher and hopefully you have more opportunity for higher profit margins. So an example of that would look like something somebody sells a book, okay? They gotta provide a, a, a book and they put a funnel out there in the world and they sell a book. And after somebody buys the book, then they would get marketed to buy the next level on the ladder, which could be a video uh, a, a training video talking about how to implement strategies in the book. That's maybe like, so the book may be, you know, 19 bucks and the video may be $79. Okay. So that's your next step on the value ladder. And then you may offer a full born, blown course on um, 10 classes that get released once a week for a period of time that allow you to try teach them at a strategy or other things at a different level that's priced at seven ninety seven or nine ninety seven something like that and so I would be looking at options here to provide a level of service that leads to another a step up in the ladder into another level of service and then even another level so having multiple levels is ne never an issue most companies strive for this and if you can implement this in your business and provide something that leads to the higher level, okay? I mean, a lot of coaches out there in the world provide some type of maybe training videos, and then they provide the next higher level service, maybe a $5,000 package where they're doing live coaching or sessions with people um, that they've pulled together a smaller group that pay at a higher level and you get even more value from that next level customer that's willing, that likes what you're doing, gets value from what you're doing and then wants to go to the next step and willing to pay for the next step because they feel it's going to change their lives, help their lives, help their businesses in some way. Okay, hope that helps. Okay, let's see. Next question. Brad. Brad asks, how do you know when the time is right to leave your full-time job and go on, uh, go all in, in your on your business? Business description and background a question. I'm currently a full-time firefighter and a paramedic for a local municipality and have 13 years of service invested with 12 more for retirement. The climate has changed dramatically and although I never dreamed I would ever consider leaving the fire service, I find myself struggling to find a reason to stay. My business has been growing slowly over the last several years, but it's still not at the point where I feel comfortable leaving the guaranteed income of my fire job. However, I totally burned out. I am totally burned out and ready to leave. It's the fear that's holding me back and the lure of the guaranteed income and benefits that keeps me there. So how do I know when it's the right time um, or when I should make the leap? Okay. So I'd like Brad, I'd like to know a little bit more about your business, okay? Surface uh, medicum stock. C-O-M-V-E. So I don't, that's not giving me really any clues, but 
um, understanding what you're doing could be a little bit helpful, but there's some keys to the basics of what you said, okay? I can provide you some thought and insight, is that your business is never gonna get to you where you really want it to go until you go all into the business and fully commit and put the energy there to make it push it forward and and make it spin okay um, I had a friend that I watched for years and I kept trying to motivate and coach him he was a friend and he admired my business success and we'd uh, we we're in different towns and so he'd come to visit uh, my town because he he come to visit Knoxville because he actually played football at the University of Tennessee and um, but he lived in upstate New York and he would he had this business that was doing a clothing brand uh, he became a successful football player in Europe and and, uh, and he created a company called Drysick and with that he was putting out this brand but he was a pharmaceutical rep and he continued on being a rep for years and years and years while he tried to grow the business and the business was doing all right wasn't doing all right i mean it was kind of doing all right it wasn't like but he never felt he could make that leap and i kept saying mark until you jump into your business that's the only time it's going to change and lo and behold it, there was an offering from the company that trying to downsize a little bit or change the product line or something and they offered like a buyout opportunity to get some people to leave and Mark finally took that opportunity and he could, took the buyout and he was able to um, put into his business and you know what when he did the business started rocking He's got like, you know, 10,000 foot uh, warehouse space now where they make the clothing. They market to all kinds of different people. He's got a patent on a product that he's putting out there called Fan Hands, um, which helps like the clapping. They got little pieces on them that they clap when they, when you, um, you're at, when you're supporting one of your teams. So point to this is that your business will be better when you can put it full time. Now, what's this mean economically for you, right? What is that struggle and what is that, what is that time period? And it's and no one else can say but you, but if you have saved some money, have a little bit there that you can, you can jump in your business and get it going, you can ramp that business up. Do you have a spouse that could help pay, to help support some of the bills? And if that's the case, then you at least know that you can pay the rent then you can make this leap and go. You may have to struggle for a little bit, but that there's going to be a little bit of a transition period for you. But making that transition is going to allow you to um, have more fulfillment in life and more meaning in life because you're following your passion. You've lost your passion for a firefighter, and I get it. You know what? When I was young, um, this goes back a long time, but if you remember the show Emergency, uh, squad 51 <laughs> well I was a huge fan and that's what I wanted to be when I grew up as a paramedic and I realized that over time that you know it was I didn't realize economics at the time and realized that they don't make that much money and even though I was so fascinated with helping people and putting out fires and saving lives and so on and so forth it was um, uh, it w wasn't for me and I realized that really inner is my my passion for business growing a business putting a product out there in the marketplace and so on and so forth so anyway um i would say do what you are going to get more out of your life even if you're making a little bit less money that meaning and fulfillment you're going to get is going to be so much more than what you are doing right now feeling stuck feeling held back and make the leap you will grow your income as long as you stay focused and put your passion, find the right coaching, which is what you're doing now, to help you get through some of the tough spots and help maybe make it go a little faster because you're just not trying to do it all by yourself. Looking for knowledge and experience out there can help you. So good luck with that, Brad. Look forward to more questions on where you are and maybe more about your business going forward. Kelly. Kelly asks, what things could you rec would you recommend I do to help me be better Man, managing my time. Business description, back on a question. Kelco is an evacuate uh, excavation company and specializing trenching, site prep, road work, 
aggregate hauling and heavy equipment operations to include forestry, land clearing, and most earthwork operations. I'm looking for the most effective way to manage my daily tasks, business, family, time, personal growth, time, and me time. I have a family, I have a daily monthly planner, but I'm thinking there are, there has to be more effective ways to manage my time. I feel like I should be more productive. Well, this is a forever age old question and there's been a lot written about it, a lot of books out there about it. And you could read a lot and you can get a little bit and it may not even change things. So uh, given that I've been exposed to a lot of this, all these speakers I've heard around the world, all these people that have written books, I was reading 40 books a year from 2000 to 2012 ish or so. And I just read so much about business leadership, personal growth, um, you know, even a little bit of nonfiction in there, spiritual growth and so forth. And with all that, I can't come to some conclusions about things that resonate with me. Okay. And that is, you got to look at the 80, 20 principle in the way life works. Okay. Meaning that, um, 20% of what you do is going to lead to 80% of your results or 20% of your clients make up 80% of your revenue. Okay. There's all, you can look at this so many different ways. So, what I'm going to apply that to here in your world is that 20% of what you do on a daily basis is going to apply to 80% of the effectiveness and output that you're going to create. So what are those things? So what I like to do is I like to put in, I like to look at what's the top three things that I'm going to accomplish today. Okay. And have a thought about that. If I'm trying to simplify this, okay, I can get more detailed, but I realize trying to be very detailed just gets me more bogged down. So I look at what are the top three things I want to accomplish today. And when I know I get those done, then I will, I can move on and deal with the daily grind, the daily um, like questions from um, clients, uh, issues from employees and so forth that you have to deal with as the day goes on. I also would do, um, uh, you know, look at this and say, what is some focus time that I can have? Okay, time, quiet time. When I had the investment firm early on, I didn't go to work till like 10 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock. And why? Well, I would get up and, you know, do my morning routine stuff. Um, some part of that time I was taking my son to school and then I come back and I would read. I would read and contemplate and focus on things. We were in investment world and, we, and our decisions about what we were buying and doing was a result of our, our um, knowledge and where the world was going and so forth. So our reading, the reading aspect was very important. So before I had employee issues and those mutual fund issues and running a fund and the fund accounting and the custody and the customer service and all that, I would spend this focused time reading. And then when I got to work, all hell could break loose. And I, I had a great, I would have a great day because no matter what I planned to do, that was always something else pushing that intention out of the way. I got done the most important things in that morning time period and the rest of the day could go as it goes and I would I would feel like I had a huge accomplishment because I was focused on a certain things. So what is it that is your 20%? What is it that is your top three that you would need to focus on that when you get these three things done and even boil that down to the top one, what is the number one thing you need to do today to be better? And I like to add, you know, a second or third, like smaller issue to that. But what is the number one thing you need to do today? If you do, you're going to have a 1% improvement in your work, in your life, in your company. Okay. And you just think about that 1%, that's kind of small. Well, 1% every day adds up to hundreds of percent a year. So put that in and just look at that as an option for you to manage your time. That frees you up so that me time that other time is not as concerning i would i felt like i had to be doing something in my early part of my career that i was always reading and i had magazine i had forbes and fortune and business week and i felt i had to read every single one of them and i had to read a wall street journal every day and it, and it got to a point where that i was so 
stressed about making sure I was accumulating all this knowledge that I missed out on some time with my son and so forth that um, as time went on and I focused on these top three things, I was able to get somewhere. Uh, I mean, I was able to get more relaxed about my life and like what I was doing after my work time and feel like I could let, let go because I had an accomplishment. I had a win for that day. Okay, Kelly? So hopefully that helps and you can um, you can get something out of that and focus on what are the key aspects for you moving forward. So, next question. Rosalie asked, I was asking, what are the best way, what are the best ways to discuss work performance concerns with team members in a way that will help them improve rather than feel frustrated? Business description and background of question. I have an accounting firm. When a team member goes uh, gets stuck with a client's work, I jump on a call with them and resolve the issue almost immediately. I have seen them get frustrated and embarrassed with themselves. How can I better these communication conversations so we have we're feeling great and positive? So we uh, we leave feeling great and positive. Sorry. Okay. So, Rosalie, I have a motto that applies to the way I've uh, the evolved by the, what I've experienced with uh, hundreds of employees that were hired and, and, and those that were let go and so forth over time. This says that you either coach people up or you push them out, okay? That's all on a positive basis, okay? Coach them up and it's everything and all our interactions with them is to, is to get them to the next level, is to make them, help them have a step forward. Help them see and be able to become the leader like you are. Lead themselves, lead others. And that is a key to what we're trying to do with other people. So coach them up or push them out, okay? All that you can do a lot of coaching and sometimes it just doesn't matter. And it's gonna be best for you and that person if they are motivated to move on to something that's gonna meet their strengths, gonna meet who they are. Okay, you're freeing them up to go on to a place where they are um, better suited for something else. Okay, I've seen it happen over and over. I had employees, I had, they weren't getting it, they weren't doing it, what I needed done, and I had to let them go. And I let them go under that mindset that, you know what, there's something better out there for you. And I've had so many of them come back to me and said, hey, Greg, thank you. You were right. It was, and this, of course, it's not about being right. It's kind of about their lives being better, okay? I was in a, I was not right for that role, and now i am found a place that I'm excelling at, I'm in flow, and so on. And when you do that, it just makes you feel better about the fact that you stood up and got somebody out of a role that they weren't, wasn't right for them, okay? So... Um, what else can I say about this? Uh, so, what I would like to do when I'm working with people in their situation is I always go to them, I always ask them what they would do, okay? Uh, people, I had employees come to my office, Greg, we got a problem with this and this and this and this and this is happening and what's going on? And I'm like, okay, so what do you think we should do about it? And I let them ramble on a little bit. Sometimes they would have an idea. Sometimes they really wouldn't. And then I try to talk them through it. I try to say, "Hey, well, have you thought about this? Or you know, what what what's causing this situation?" I was just trying to push the dialogue along. So whenever I was able to get them to start thinking and then come back and just talking it through, and they come up with something good they walk away feeling better about themselves. They walk away feeling that they've grown a little bit and that they are valuable to the team. So if you want to help them make them feel better, help them figure out what the answers are to the questions, okay? It's gonna take a little bit longer. You, with your experience, you just knock it out just like that. What is it that you can help them become that next level and and or take their knowledge to the next level by engaging them in questions okay so you know the answer so then how did you learn to get to that and help maybe take steps towards them figuring out how to answer questions that 
are, are, are answered in a way that's analytical or logical or even not, then how should they best go about that? From your experience and your situation, that's where you want to come to. Uh, so let's grow. And so I think that's all, but you know, I'll add one thing to it is that remembering that the definition of a leader, a good leader, is one who makes more leaders, not gets more followers, okay? You are out there to try to make more leaders and you don't want people to have to always come to you for the answers. If they do, you're not gonna grow as fast. You're not gonna scale. You need people to be stepping up and thinking and working and doing the things that are gonna make your company better. And that's get, getting them to think for themselves, okay? So go out there, Rosalie, and make some more leaders and um, build that company. So Rosalie asked another question, how do I make a first meeting with a new contract productive a new contact I'm sorry a new contact productive I have an accounting firm located in South Florida for the past year I have been working on adding people from my prospect list on LinkedIn occasionally I invite them to have a coffee with me but don't want to make it so long that it will be an inconvenience to them I'm a little lost on how that meeting should work and how long it should last and what is the objective obviously i want new clients or spheres of influence help okay so my thoughts on this is very simple based on my experience with learning a lot from eric mannix the guy who caught saddam hussein that we have we're building out a program called high value listening and with that is i would take this approach okay take this in all areas of your life but definitely with clients and potential clients and prospects, people you want to build relationships with, is that you go into that to find out about them. You don't have to come in with some type of checklist. You don't have to come in with, um, you know, this is the perfect sales pitch or smooth uh, thing that if I tell them they're going to be on board, you go in and you find out about them. Hey, um, Tom, what's, you know, so how, what's going on in your world? Yeah, you got any challenges with business? And as they talk, you hear what they're saying and you go deeper with that and you keep going deeper with that, okay? And you keep going deeper again. You figure out what is their area of concern and thought and the more you ask about them, the more you understand them, the more, the better the relationship you will be building and you will be creating the highest level of trust is what Eric Maddox talks about and how he was able to capture Saddam Hussein um, as an interrogator without doing any waterboarding or other things. He just learned to listen to people. When he found out the tactics he was taught in the military weren't working, he evolved this approach and got people to open up and he continued to refine it and hone it. And with that, he able to build the highest levels of trust by asking these questions. So many of us do this. We're talking to somebody and they're telling us about their life and they may say something like, um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I recently visited South Florida. And like you said, you're from South Florida. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're South. Yeah, I have a place in Fort Lauderdale and I go there a lot. And I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, but I really love Lauderdale. And I live in Lauderdale by the sea area. And with that, so what did I just do? I turned this about me instead of continuing to make it about them. So that's called a boomerang. And what you want to do is you want to stay focused on them. You don't want to tell them when, even when they open up the opportunity in these initial meetings to tell them about how, what great service you provide is that you continue to ask about them. At some point, they may turn the conversation and ask you for something specific and then you tell them. But initially, you're saying, what do you want to do in these first meetings? You want to build a relationship and you want to build the highest level of trust so that it will move down the line. They will want to help you. If you go away and they did all the talking and you didn't, you just asked questions and you left, you can be like, well, I didn't tell them anything about myself. But you know what you just did? That person will walk away and say, wow, they are so cool. I really like them. Why will they say that? Because you were engaged to understanding about them. They wanted to be heard and you heard them. And when you do, you build this uh, connection that is very powerful, okay? So that's the way to get started, in my opinion, in my experience of what I've seen out there and I've seen, I've been working with Eric for three years now and watching him, what he does is very powerful and um, I think it's gonna be best for you, so.
hope that helps. Okay, and my last question here is, Kelly asked, Kelly uh, asked, how do you deal with feeling vulnerable, anxious, after letting everyone know everything about your business and what you are all about? Back, background and description and question, we strive for excellence as an evacu uh, excavation company, specializing in trenching, site prep, road work, ag aggregate hauling, and heavy equipment operations. I am feeling really vulnerable right now and super anxious. I'm going to all general contact crap general contractors, the city halls, um, uh, fire, residential buildings, social media platforms, and generally letting it all hang out, trying to land a job uh, or a subcontract. I didn't expect to feel like I am right now. Okay, so Kelly, I'm not sure where you're coming from because is this coming from an area of you're saying you're trying to land business and you feel like you're not getting it, so you're getting stressed and anxious, so you need to like, you're just putting it out there and saying, hey, I'm in a, like a tight situation, you got any work for me? And yeah, and yes, I don't know if that's, it's, I would not say when you, people feel desperation, they're not interested in acting, okay? They may feel empathy for you or they may feel sorry for you, but they're not inclined to give you business. So when you say let it all hang out, open up your world to saying these are the areas of value that I provide and see what happens from there, okay? Um, so just being careful about this, not that you can't be real, and being but real to what level and just talking about your world you're living in. Uh, but when you ask, when you put things out there in a desperation mode, it will not come back to you in as a positive a way as you would like. So I hope that helps, Kelly. Um, everybody have a good month. Look forward to chatting again next month. Until then, onward and upward and keep pushing, keep being tenacious and making your life spin. Take care.